Here it is, Sonic Frontiers. Probably the most hyped up Sonic game in over a decade since Sonic Generations, if I am honest. Ever since that very first teaser trailer with Sonic just running away from enemies and having this weird aura surrounding him, people were very curious about what was in store for the next 3D title. And as soon as the Game Awards happened of that same year, we got the reveal of what this game was going to be about, a sandbox Sonic game. And granted, the idea in and of itself was something people were interested in since the release of a fan game called Sonic Utopia, a game that's all about showcasing a 3D perspective of the classic formula. It's alright, but a little too easy to abuse the physics to the point where you're not really playing the game, you're just seeing how much can you stay in the air doing nothing but keeping... And sorry for the slur... Momentum. I know, I know, I said the M word, better get used to it. And granted, it's technically not the first time Sonic Team has done some form of sandbox level design. Depending on how you look at it, Shadow the Hedgehog uses some form of sandbox elements and even has some levels that are all about exploring the area. The problem is that a lot of the thing that surrounds Shadow the Hedgehog is a goddamn mess that I plan on making a video about it. Hope you look forward to it. The point being, Sonic Team has shown interest in the concept of an open game. As the weeks and months went on, people were looking into as many details as they could in order to get some idea of what the game will actually be. There were details that got people excited from the start, like having Ian Flynn, the chief writer for some of the Sonic comics for Archie after Ken Penders left with all his Akinda bullshit, and is now in charge of the IDW comics for Sonic. And if the reaction from fans was anything to go by, this was considered a good thing as he's known for being able to write a solid and serious story while also respecting and understanding the source material. So if you're a fan of the adventure era of storytelling that fleshed out the world and characters, you had something to look forward to. And then the IGN showcase happened. Yeah, the first ones to actually get the chance to see what the game was about, and people were not impressed at all. The showcase made a lot of people uneasy, while others just sort of knew this wasn't the best showcase of that since well, it's IGN. I respect the people that work for the company, but giving IGN the chance to talk about Sonic games is like giving Nintendo a fan game. You just kind of know the impression you're going to get from the star you're familiar with their history. However, there was one little bit at the end of their videos that kept people hopeful. But ultimately, my time with this early build answered the one question I had on my mind. My time with this early build... My time with this early build... That didn't stop people from bitching and saying that Origins was going to be the best to come out of 2022 in terms of video games. Which you can check my two videos talking about the collection, but in a brief summary... <laughs> The waiting was just painful because, at least on Twitter, as you would expect, people didn't even know what to complain about. Some complaints were fair, but a bit over dramatic complaints on collision detection. Like, seriously, I read, I can't take it anymore, and I read it like, oh my god, <laughs> the world is horrible, like, I cannot take it anymore. And the common complaints about physics in the game, which I'm not even gonna start that issue just yet. We're just starting the video. But trust me, this wasn't the worst of them all. Introducing to you the new nitpick from the Sonic fanbase, muscle curves on the eyes. Forget the green eyes, quills, and the blue arms that only appear in side projects. This is what being part of the Sonic community is about. I should make clear, you can be nitpicking and still be correct. One doesn't contradict the other. But honestly, the moment we need to have not only a side-to-side -side comparison to get the point across, but also the need to highlight the specific little detail you're talking about and still have an issue making your point across until you reach the need to play the typical if you don't like that comment on a public post made on a website that's labeled as social media, it only shows that the attempt for discussion went south. It happens. And no, I'm not covering the names because, first off, if you think me joking about this justifies you going around and be rude directly to the people I mentioned, you're on your own on that. I don't condone it and you need mental medical attention. But also because this is what waiting for a new Sonic game turns into. Just constant attempts of being the next big discussion. And then it all becomes backlash and backlash towards the backlash hill. To the point where you just want the game to come out so people can shut up. And while that was happening, 
I think it's worth mentioning that something that was already a sign of how proud was Sonic Team about this game is the abundance of promotional content in order to hype the game. Because when you look back at the last 5 years with Sonic Forces, the most we got was the teaser trailer, the reveal of the OC system, soundtrack, one gameplay showcase, and one trailer. And then there was Team Sonic Racer which was just an animated short. And that's it, my god that game was whatever. Meanwhile in Frontiers not only were they actually hunting down everybody that was trying to leak the soundtrack outside of the few tracks that they teased, but they were also showing the mechanics, overview trailers, interviews about the music, an animated prologue from Knuckles' perspective, just hype trailers of Super Sonic presence in the game, demo releases to different platforms like I mentioned with IGN, and even taking different forms of press to Hawaii in order to test the game. The marketing alone shows that they really wanted people to pay attention to this game. They even worked on early announcements for collaboration DLC with Monster Hunter to give Sonic a Rathalos armor. And here's my nitpick bullshit, why is the armor brown in the R collab? It's supposed to be red! The Monster Hunter part of the R collab looks nice too and they handled the design for Sonic quite well, but it's not like they just painted it cyan for no reason. It's nitpick bullshit, but it matters to me, so according to these assholes that I mentioned before, you should care too. And after all of that, uh, the game finally came out. People played it and enjoyed it while also admitting there are flaws. Some were a matter of preference and others are isolated into the game itself. But the most consistent thing here is that the game holds a lot of promise and ambition. I know ambition is also a word that people are getting sick with this series, but in this case, the ambition was more noticed about the future that this game offers. So what was it about this game that made people excited about what the series might offer next? Well, for the sake of going as clear as I can, I'll be tackling this in a form of journal review, so I can talk about my experience with every single detail this game had to offer, and my thoughts on series experience as I went on. Which obviously means, spoilers are up ahead at full display, you have been warned, so let's dive into the latest 3D Sonic game to date, Sonic Frontier. That was the intro! I'm going to take a moment on how my beginning with the game went since it was a very interesting experience that influenced the rest of the game for me. Which is expected if we consider the concept of first impressions, but let me explain it a different way. The story begins with Eggman setting up a device in this particular structure, which seems to be with the intention of controlling whatever's inside of it. However, things don't seem to go entirely as planned and Eggman gets sucked into the structure alongside the device he placed in. And this is already setting up a lot of questions, from the basic one of what the fuck just happened, to other subtle ones like why were there sudden screams and what's with this sudden protection sequence. As well as the weird decision to not have the device dialogue to be subtitled in the game. It's all simple stuff that's basic narrative setting but it helps to give the audience a sense of mystery, which is the overall point of the game's beginning. Then we get a direct cut to Sonic, Tails and Amy flying towards Starfall Islands, with the purpose of investigating how did the Chaos Emeralds ended up being drawn into this location. Like they just suddenly appear in this area, so they wonder how did that even happen. Unfortunately, reaching the islands causes the tornado's technology to start going haywire, which causes our heroes to get teleported into what looks to be a wormhole and after that, BAM! Our first cyber stage. And no, this isn't the IGN footage, this is just me testing out the controls and how they fit with both the level design and my own management on both. I noticed there's red rings, so I decided to try and collect all of them before I even attempt blast processing the game. After my first run, I realized you can just retry the stages right away despite being at the beginning of the game, which I appreciate since I want that S rank now! And I begin testing my controls with speed. 
And as a heads up, I'm going to be using a lot of comparisons to kind of help myself on getting things across. So I apologize in advance. That said, in terms of how Sonic moves at the beginning of the game, this is definitely a slower game than previous Sonic games in the last decade. But if I had to use a measurement, I'd say it's a middle point between how Sonic moves at the beginning of the storybook games like Secret Rings and how he moves in Sonic Unleashed. There's enough speed to be faster than your average platformer, but you can still have a clear vision of what's ahead of you so you can react with time. This is something I think it's important to establish right now, so I'll make this clear. I understand if this kind of pace isn't what most people know Sonic for, let alone what they want from him. That said, I think this is a solid enough balance for those who want a fast-paced platformer and those who are beginning to see what Sonic is about. Hell, one thing that's interesting about this game is how you can adapt the way Sonic controls. His average speed, boost speed, camera movement, the weight when turning, acceleration, how fast do you want the camera to move, the distance of the camera, it's quite open to customization to your preferable pacing with the controls. So while it took me a couple of hours to get fully used to the control scheme, I felt like the game was always letting me play to my own accord, which is fitting for this control scheme. I will talk about this later down the road, but when it comes to how Sonic moves, I can at least start with the statement that it's different enough to have its own identity with the many takes on the boost gameplay, since this is still the fundamental formula with Sonic's mobility, but it also has enough familiarity with said formula to not catch people off guard. Like I said, I will not talk too much about this just yet. There we go, finally. There was nothing perfect about that wrong at all game. Sonic wakes up in front of what seems to be a similar artifact than what Eggman was trying to hack, with the voice telling him how he apparently just escaped the cyberspace, something that seems impossible to achieve, so he is the key. To what exactly, we don't know, but he has to find the Chaos Emeralds. We were already going to do that, destroy the Titans, we don't know what those are, and tear down the walls between dimensions. Yeah, okay, sure. How about a little context? Hello? Yeah, you should probably get used to what the fuck is that? Oh well, some direction is better than none. Here we go. After that, we get a simple tutorial area to also learn how the mechanics of the open areas play out. Very rudimentary stuff. Try reaching this bounce pad to get a collectible, do this little activity to discover a certain part of the map, Learn the basics of the combat system, the level up system, how your map works, very common stuff for an open kind of game. And yeah, I'm going by the term open game rather than open world because while there are similarities, I think Sonic Frontiers manages to be a more sandbox kind of adventure than the Zelda counterpart that we all know. In fact, which I'm sure people who have played it might have noticed or might have even said it at this point. This game takes a lot more traditions with how Mario Odyssey and Banjo-Tooie handle open level design rather than something like Skyrim or, as I said, the obvious one, Breath of the Wild. Take this section, for instance. I didn't know the light speed dash at the time, so I was stuck figuring out how to get the collectible, but thanks to some sense of curiosity and, to be honest, stubbornness, I figured out a way to get it anyway. That's the kind of stuff that I love about this genre including something less open like metroidvanias, the level design was already showing me that if I am creative enough, I can get away with certain tricks and overcome challenges in my own way. In terms of what you can do, well, you have a lot of the techniques that have defied Sonic throughout the years. Jump, double jump, homing attack, bounce attack, sidestep, boost, light speed dash, and drop dash, which can only be executed by holding the jump button after you do the double jump. It's a bit unnecessary, but since the boost works like a stamina meter, shut up, if you ever run out of boost, the drop dash can work as a way to keep up the pace. Now, as for the new stuff, keeping up with the first hour, the Cycloop ability. By holding down a specific button, Sonic leaps a trail which by turning into a full circle with it, it can cause different effects. It can stun enemies, activate certain objects in the world, or discover hidden objects on the ground. But let's stick with the combat for now. You have a skill tree that, in all honesty, you might end up filling up by the time you reach the second island. These improve your combat system. In concept, they're as basic as smashing one button in order to perform combos, but thanks to the abilities you unlock from both the skill tree as well as progressing to the game, 
different abilities like a sonic boom attack which might as well just be the sonic win seriously why not call it sonic win instead of boom you also unlock something called the phantom rush which by filling up a combo bar it causes sonic to get some extra speed and strength when performing a combo in the middle of a fight you also learn an air trick which depending on the situation allows sonic to just pull acrobatics in midair for the sake of more skill points it's a fun little bonus while exploring i'll admit but anyway, I finally reached the second portal. Again guys, <laughs> this isn't me shitting on the game. I'm just the type of player that takes things slowly when having to look for the red rings. There you go. Oh, I got everything but the time trial. Okay, let's go. Damn! Okay, we're getting somewhere it's better than before. Damn! Okay, okay, we're very close. We're improving each time. Let's go. This shouldn't take too long. Fuck! Fuck! We did worse! Fuck! Oh, come on, come on. No, no, I was so close. Oh, all right, one more time, one more time. Oh, you son of a mother of goddamn asshole. Yes! Yes, 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 yes! I did it! It took me 20 minutes, but I did it! Oh my god, I'm having fun! I know it's also an annoying joke to make a statement like this, but for the sake of context, the last Sonic game I actually enjoyed playing from beginning to end was Sonic Lost World. But not only can I say at this point in the game that I enjoy it more than that game, which was an experience in which I simply said, it was fun, I enjoyed my time. Definitely better than spending the money on a cheap hooker. Not disregarding anybody that likes things more or less than I do, it's just a reality of my own experience. So for me, the fact that I was just starting the tutorial to open the level design and on the second level of the cyber stages, all after one hour of playtime, I knew I was going to have a good time. After finishing that stage, I was given bolt keys, with some extra keys for completing all challenges of the game which then revealed the name of the game, collect enough bolt keys to then unlock access to the chaos emeralds in these containers. And I think I overdid it since it unlocked 3 emeralds and I just started. And then I got this bridge to materialize and it seemed like the game finally opened up. It even generated some rails for me to quick travel to the opening area if I ever needed to. I don't think I ever did need to use it, but it showed progress and methods to speed off any possible backtrack. And yeah, it was here that I started noticing some of the popping that this game has been heavily called out for. Is it there? Yes. Is it just as annoying as some people have mentioned? Yes. That said, it's never really game breaker or it never gets to have an effect on your gameplay as the popping tends to happen with elements that are just far enough from whatever you might be doing at the moment. Like you're not gonna deal with some form of popping in the middle of a platforming challenge. Everything will appear way before you need to know it's there in order to keep playing without any issue. That doesn't justify the abundance of it, nor does it dismiss the criticism of it. It shouldn't be there at all, but I can at least give credit on how it was handled, so there was never a point where your playtime gets affected outside of the visual edge. But the matter is, I was excited for what the game had to offer me based on this first hour of playing. Even though most of that time was me just trying to not play the game the way they wanted me to, but just like the achievement told me, the journey for Sonic Frontiers had just begun. Now, I could just proceed with the plot, but I also want to just mess around, and so I did. Found this guy that levels up my attack and defense when I find certain red and blue seeds, and oh look, I cannot unlock this portion of the map because the course is set on night. That's nice. 
but to be fair, I just started so I can just fuck around with the island. As I was traveling, I was also able to find these little heart tokens, but didn't know what to think of them. But at this point, I played enough of this genre to know it's better to collect them as soon as I can. I also found this giant creature called Ashura, with a simple mechanic but also very easy to break apart. You have to climb your way to the top and break these three cores from it, but the trick is that the movement can get so crazy to the point of just losing yourself. Luckily, the game doesn't punish you beyond having to try again, and if you somehow die, you respawn right before the boss or obstacle course you die from, allowing you to try again and not waste any time beyond keep on going. This is also where I discovered that if you make a random circle with your side loop ability, you can generate rings. In any other game, this will be broken as hell, but here it's just a method for you to always have access to rings, which means access to means to protect yourself and fill up your total ring limit. More on that later. There we go, and we got our third gear. This one works as a collectible to access the cyber stages, and this is where there's a three-way route for collectibles. You want the Chaos Emeralds from these containers? You need bulkies, and when you want those, you need to beat the cyber stages, and to access those, you need to collect these gears from just exploring or primarily beating bosses. How do you do all that? By playing the game! No need for drama. Oh yeah, it's night and I'm close to the puzzle I couldn't play. I have to silo these things. Don't know the need to do the specific thing at only night. I can see being easier to do at night for the obvious lack of sunlight, but I don't know, I think this could have been kept free of specific scheduling. As I kept playing, I realized I was collecting some little rock creatures scattered around the level and oh boy did the PTSD could not have felt more real at that moment. But I decided to simply let it go and continue with my journey and god, this game is so relaxing to walk or what the fuck is that thing? Is that another boss like Ashura? I gotta fight it. Okay, I guess we're doing acrobatics now. Do I blame you? Die. It's a good thing I upgraded myself to get the Sonic Boom so I can take down these guys with ease since you have to break every single sphere surrounding it. Oh, here's a yellow emerald. Might as well grab- Oh shit! There it is! I found you! Wait, let's get ready for our- Oh fuck! Hold on, hold on! Damn it! I blame you! Okay, so I guess I got to- Oh, you dick! Okay, so I guess the trail it leaves behind is something I have to get on so I can proceed with the fight. But as I kept traveling to figure out a place to land on Squid, I found weird platforms with a tower creature for me to fight, as well as more map puzzles for me to clear up. And it was really that simple to get sucked into the world's design, taste of the different things to do and different things to discover as I also found the Chaos Emerald. And even discovering that exploring can also reward you with bulk keys. After that, I discovered this bigger version of the little creatures, which got me to know the name of his race, Coco. This is the Elder Coco, which, as its Hermer counterpart, can help me increase some of my stats after giving them a specific amount of collectibles. In the Elder's case, it's some of its kind, and it can increase my speed and ring count. Oh yeah, you have a limit of 400 rings to keep by default, but you can increase up to 999, but to be honest, I focused on speed since I knew I would want to explore these areas really fast. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to get a move on in the plan of research for Amy. Hold on girl, I just need to fight that squid. Oh look, a seagull! And it has animation on its wings. Did you know people complain about that? Surprising, isn't it? Oh look, a new cyberspace portal and some... purple coins. Oh fuck, let's do this first, then we go to the squid and then Amy. Cyberspace 1-4 is based on modern Green Hill from Sonic Generations, I'm not gonna identify the reference of every stage, but I'll try my best. And now we get a quick cutscene about what happened to Eggman. He also got sent to the cyberspace where he cannot figure out a way to get out, and his intention is to decipher the secrets of it all. There we go, I finally found the squid and Jesus, this thing kicked my ass because it was my first real exposure to the parry system. If you manage to time it correctly, you can counter enemy attacks, which for this asshole was pretty essential in order to try to hit it. Other than that, Running across its trail as fast as I can, while also dodging its attacks, was pretty fun. And when I managed to beat it, it was completely satisfying and I felt like I was getting better at the game. Something that makes me love this genre is the possibility of being in complete calm by doing mere exploration and seeing what the scenery has to offer. Sometimes it's the platforming challenge, other times it's the serenity of the environment for you to walk, 
and with Sonic it was not only the feel of traveling in cool ways thanks to the platforming, but it was also giving me a huge sense of freedom. In the series, Sonic has always been shown as a character that's all about freedom and being what went the win. And man, this game manages to communicate that feeling through gameplay. I was always with the urge of exploring, the urge of getting to the next area, see what a course wanted me to try. It wasn't just the blast processing speed what was fun. It was just the mere movement that felt fun. Okay, more, more on that later. I found this specific signal to look different than the rest of the ones that opened the map, telling me that I cannot try it until I progress through the story. And okay, th that's fine, I'm at least being told in advance there's only so much I can do without playing through the story. That's okay. And it wasn't until this point that I noticed how you can use a specific marker as a means to set a specific destination. Kinda like how you set markers in Grand Theft Auto. And I know it's right on the screen, but I'm an idiot, remember that. It also helped me notice what is the exact amount of space of the map to be recovered when doing a specific segment. As well as the more of these segments you unlock, the level manages to give you methods to make your travel on foot less taxing by giving you rails to grind, which also leads to more challenges and thus, more gain to be playing. And after that, in all honesty, that was it. I was just enjoying myself with all the exploration and trying to clear the map as fast as I could in order to find all the challenges that level had to offer, as well as the cyber portals. Was I forgetting something? Get away from me! Oh, look at that. Momentum-based gameplay! Are you annoyed already? I am too. Cyberspace 1.5 was inspired by modern chemical plant from Sonic Generations. It was a fun level with a lot of variety in its level design when it comes to multiple pathways, which is fun in terms of platforming action, but it made me panic with the red rings. Luckily, most if not all of them were found by just playing the regular path, keeping the multiple sections available for speedrunning. Then there was this other section that needed to be played at night in order to be cleared. And okay, I will give this one a pass as it seems to be gimmick with nature. I know I could say the same for the previous one, but this just felt more logical to me. Cyberspace 1.7 is where I actually got excited. It's City Escape, but the layout is from Sonic Adventure 2. I knew thanks to the press marketing that we were going to get levels based off different eras of Sonic, not just the boost era, but I was worried about the abundance in which we were going to get them. Is there going to be a proper balance in terms of level layouts or will it be mostly levels from the boost era? That was my question, but I was happy to see them using this layout over the generations one. Primarily because since those games had a completely different style of movement, that means the developers had to find workarounds to adapt the levels therefore creating a brand new experience for these runs. It managed to give me a similar feeling that when playing a part of the original for the first time, despite clearly not playing in that form, it made me optimistic. There we go, we finished exploring the map and by doing so, we unlock fast traveling, meaning I can just go from portal to portal in order to make my exploration even faster? That's awesome! It's gonna make reaching the cyber stages much easier. Cyber Stage 1-6 is, I assume, based on a level from Classic Sonic, and this is where I should address the elephant in the room. No, Sonic Frontiers does not have the same level of weight in its movement as he did not only in the Genesis type of games, but it doesn't even have the same kind of weight as he will do in Unleash or Generations. You can notice this the most when boosting. You see, pressing the boost button isn't enough for Sonic to actually boost you need to have directional movement with the analog stick to trigger it. This is why you get to see moments where I simply stop instantly while moving. Or if I don't have the correct input, Sonic will just drop from a loop, losing any sense of gravity or in Sonic Tuber words, it lacks physics. However, I will dare to argue that when it comes to the overall control and level design of the game, it doesn't really need that control in order to be accelerating and enjoyable when it's original content. The moment the game tries to not only use the 2D sections, but also level layouts that are more related to classic Sonic or even previous boost games like I mentioned before, the easier it is to notice the issues and how the Frontier's control scheme doesn't match 100% with a level design that requires that kind of movement. It is completely doable to not only beat the game, but to also speed run through it. However, I will admit that it was very easy to tell this was going to be an inconvenience to overcome. 
Stage 1 tree felt reminiscent of classic speed highway, but do not quote me on that, I could easily be wrong. What I do know is, fuck this stupid spring, it messed up my time, I could have completed the level on my first try. Blech. But okay, that was all the portals according to my Xbox. What's the- Oh yeah, Amy! Oh fuck! If you're a fan of Amy Rose, first off, I'm sorry, but I recommend you to give Ray, known on social media as Array of Drawing, some support. She has an incredible sense of detail and passion for the pin girl, as well as a vibrant color palette, and also a creative sense of designs that will make you enjoy her work every single time she makes a post. At the time of this video, you can find her on Tumblr, Instagram, and Twitter under the name of Screen, Array of Drawings. So if she ends up going to different platforms, you can find her through that name. And she also has a Patreon for adult content of the same caliber under the same name. Take that as you wish, nobody judges out loud. She's a huge fan of both the Sonic franchise and especially Amy Rose, as well as an incredible artist. So please check her out and send her all the love. Let's continue. By reaching her, I discovered the purpose for the tokens I've collected. These unlock story elements for the characters in each world, both main and side stories. But as we free Amy, we realize that Sonic is absorbing the energy that kept her trapped, which clearly affects his body in more ways than one, and Amy is only half released, as her mind is free, but her body is still absent. And as soon as that happens, I guess the popping in the game is intentional because this gigantic creature pops out of nowhere and thanks to this little girl looking being, it starts attacking us. And also tells us we must leave. Why? I don't know. And get used to it. Yeah, there we go. I got him on the rope. All he can do is tag my attacks. Oh. Uh, I'm okay. And so, the rest of the game's formula showed its true colors. Find the Chaos Emeralds in the island, defeat the Titan of the island, and save your friends. And the final collectible also got revealed. Scattered around the map, there's different types of story elements. Some are essential to the plot, like helping the Cocos complete certain personal tasks, while others are just expository dialogue. And you collect these memory tokens in order to unlock all those story pieces. In some form, they have the same purpose as the Power Stars in Mario 64, where you need to collect a certain amount in order to unlock that story bit. So thank god I played the game this way so I don't have to stop digesting the story for the sake of collecting shit. Which also leads to understand the purpose of the Coco. These creatures have the purpose of what could be considered memory backups. They're practically the essence of the creatures that used to live here, and when you help them complete their purpose, I guess they just die in peace. And I'm not gonna lie, the first time I saw this was with this mother who was trying to find their child, and when they found each other they just died, and it did mess me up a little bit to see a family dying happily. It was definitely more interesting than this little creature who I only end up fighting to tell me I suck and I have no chance of winning no matter what I do. That's all she says and doesn't explain anything. Unlike Amy who doesn't know anything for sure, but it's at least actual exposition of what this place could be. And throughout the main story elements, you had to play a couple of minigames. Which I swear this is almost the exact same minigame as that one in Pokemon Sword and Shield. And this is how you unlock the rest of the Chaos Emeralds. You see, from the cyberspaces, if you collect enough bulkies, you're only gonna find 4 Chaos Emeralds. The rest are locked behind the story itself which I think is an okay method to make sure every element of the game progresses with each other one way or another. It was also around this time when I discovered by completing fucking accident that if you reach your max level of rings, you unlock a power boost which allows him to reach maximum speed while boosting as long as he doesn't lose any rings. From my understanding, this boost basically allows Sonic to have his max level speed, so if you don't want to grind those level ups, you can just have no hit runs with the guy. And with this, I guess I can spend some time with the presentation. It's clearly undercooked. I will give credit for the camera work, it manages to always keep things interesting from a visual level, but it's also clear that it compensates how some cutscenes are just the characters standing and talking, without any movement throughout the scene. It reminded me of how the Arkham games will handle some dialogues. And as a minor nitpicky detail, but still showing the undercooked feel of it all, there's this thing in voice acting called lift flaps, which in short terms 
is how you had to match your voice with the character's mouth movement. You know, to make sure the dialogue fits the scene. Sometimes you don't even get the characters to look like they talk at all. This is just something I noticed and it's not a major deal breaker. If anything, I was more focused on how the story was actually very character driven. Not only we get enough exposition for even the gameplay features like how Sonic technically has an actual map on his head, but also the dynamic between him and Amy felt much more... I don't want to say mature, but at least more settled and they treat each other with more respect. Amy has been part of the crew since at least Sonic Unleashed and slowly but surely has been a stable part of Sonic's core social circle alongside Tails and Knuckles. But here, while it's definitely a case where their relationship is not openly stated to be romantic, it's clear that now more than ever, the two of them care about each other and are happy to have each other by their side, and are even able to have a serious moment of conversation where Amy wants to help as many people as she can, but Sonic thinks it's important to figure out what's going on in the island and knowing where Tails is before having this kind of sidetracking, as well as just the fact that he's worried about her. I know Sonic doesn't hate Amy, but this shows some small but still important development between them and how they treat each other. And her lesson from the journey with the Coco was to be able to share love with people and help them through that power, even if it means not being around the person she loves the most or maybe not seeing him again. To which Sonic sadly tells her that will not happen and wants her to see her have her own adventure. It was a little vague for me to understand since Amy does share love with the world, but I think it works well within the context of how it might affect her time with Sonic. Anyway, after that, we unlock the portion that was locked a while ago. It's a light puzzle that opens the path towards the Titan, despite only having 6 Chaos Emeralds at this point. This thing was a nightmare to do and I recommend looking at a guy. Moving on. But after that was done, I headed towards the Titan and discovered that it had the 7 Emerald on its head. It's basically a harder version of the Ashura climbing, which again, it can be a little weird to work out, but not impossible or even hard per se. But after that you unlock Super Sonic and... Look, the series has always been clear on establishing that having Super Sonic means having the ultimate power, and you can take down any danger. But given the invincible nature of the form, I don't think any other game has made such an emphasis on how much of a godlike creature Super Sonic is, and the infinite amount of possibilities he can achieve. But you can feel that power with just the opening of this fight. I guess it's also a good moment to talk about the soundtrack. The music for the islands is very smooth and emotional. It helps you stay relaxed and calm throughout your exploration. The cyber stages will be the place where you'll notice the presence of the music a lot more since it goes on different tones, though it's more on the electronic side. Makes sense, but just pointing it out. Though the music for the boss fights, I mean... Before this review, I made a small series of edits on how this track specifically will sound in a fight in Dragon Ball Super, and it fits incredibly well. This song goes hard on carrying the cathartic emotion of the fight and desire to just go and beat the shit out of this creature. Combat wise, it's essentially normal with godlike powers and as I said, this game manages to show just how powerful Sonic can actually be no matter the enemy when he's in a super form. The soundtrack manages to carry that feeling and makes you feel, well, like an invincible creature fighting another godlike creature in one-on-one -on -one combat. It's hard to describe, but similar to how exploring can give you Sonic sense of freedom, Super Sonic generates that sense of unlimited power, more than any other game. And there's nothing more satisfying than preventing the sound from looping and causing it to be in perfect synchrony with the automated piece of the music at the end. I'm just gonna leave the clip speak for itself so you can just feel the epicness of the fight.
fuck anime. After that, since we're still not done taking care of the titans, it means Amy is still trapped until then. So the best idea will be to keep on exploring the island, destroy all the titans and save our friends. Overall, a great opening level for the game and it kept me excited for the rest of the adventure. Oh, come on! Okay, uh, keeping it real and as a positive for you guys, since at this point the game has put its cards on the table, talking about the other islands will hopefully be shorter than this first one, since there's not that much to explain in terms of gameplay. Just the personal journey with the island and the specific differences. And I shall start with the main negative of this game. The moment you reach the second island, you begin to realize that this game already showed you what it's all about and it has no intention of changing. So if you were not convinced by the concept of this game, it will not change your mind at all. That said, this was my favorite island and overall section of the game. First off, and it's something that I personally felt mixed about, whatever you collect in one world stays as an exclusive collectible for that world. On one hand, I don't have a problem with this for the memory tokens, since they're dedicated to a specific character, but if you go for S ranks on the cyber stages, you unlock way more bulkies than necessary for the specific island, so it does feel like a missed opportunity to give people the incentive of collecting as many as they can. This is mostly a comment that comes from a basic collect time principle, where if you know what you're doing, you can primarily end up getting the minimum quota of collectibles so you can proceed with the main game before you're supposed to. I don't know, I just think elements like portal gears and bolt keys should have been a general collectible for all islands. There's no real in-game explanation for not being able to do that. This also applies to the cocos and I think the seeds you collected, so if you were just keeping them for later but went to a different island, you have to backtrack just for the sake of getting your upgrades. This is just a very random inconvenience, but one that kills the purpose of collecting as much objects as you can. It kind of pushes you to do the minimum and have everything done before moving on. Speaking of moving on, because I understood that the game was going for a specific formula with each island, I decided to stick to my original process and just open the entire island so I can unlock fast travel and with the collectibles I obtained during that process, being able to digest the story all at once. There were new enemies to fight, starting with this laser shooter that needs to be stunned with the side loop, and then this flying thing that steals your camera and wants you to just play the game of homing attack and kill it. May to each their own on their form of entertainment. It took me a bit to understand what this robot was about, since I thought I could use it as a form of traveling and break the game. Turns out, no, this robot will simply steal one of your emeralds and you have to grind a rail and stomp it. Um, help! Somebody! Ah, screw this, I'm taking this one instead. Hang on, Knuckles, I'm just gonna do literally anything else I can! One of the map challenges was this parry training that, as you can see, really put me to test in the timing, but I think it's good to have this type of mechanic available for a more direct practice instead of this method of training which is just random things on the screen during a load time. They're good, don't get me wrong, but this is much more effective. Which also makes me want to talk a little bit more about the control scheme. You see, despite most of Sonic's movement being well-established elements from the series, they found a way to make this game stand out in terms of how you use them. Put everything under different buttons. The boost is now triggered with the trigger buttons. The homing attack becomes a side button similar to how it was in the HD versions of Sonic Unleashed. The sidestep can be pulled with the bumpers. The light speed dashes by pressing the analog stick. The stomp is on the right side of the buttons depending on your console. And if you're on combat, in order to pull some of the different abilities you unlock, you require different button combinations like sidestepping and then pressing the homing attack. By having every action separated to a different command, not only are you in complete control of your actions, it allows you for complete versatility in when to use them, instead of being forced to deal with commands being stuck in one single button. I will make a joke about Balan Wonderworld, but I don't think Yuji Naka can watch YouTube videos in prison. As I traveled, I discovered the basic enemies earned the ability to become this pillar similar to the tower boss. This became more of an annoyance than a new challenge to overcome, and you can only stop that process by doing the side loop which will break the entire pace of the fight and exploration for me. 
Oh yeah, no, 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 I fought this sumo boss that had an awesome visual theme of bouncing all over the arena. It was a fun time. Then I got to Cyber Stage 2 3, which, hey, look, 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 you can just jump and not deal with weird clip out. Next boss, Tank. This one was one of my favorites as it's all a matter of timing your position to start spamming the homing attack. It can be both accelerating and infuriating. Cyber Stage 2 4 was Radical Highway from Sonic Adventure 2. It's fun and because of the linear nature, the developers went and gave it some form of variations to the platforming for the sake of variety. It's short but very good. Wish I could say the same for the next boss, Shark. It's just a sequence of quick time events and then beat it up. Moving on. Fuck these map challenges, I hate them. The challenge is simple, one on the blue dots in a sequence that allows you to cover them all, but as I said, I'm an idiot, so if I don't see a pattern, I just get upset, which makes me fuck up even more. It's not the game's fault, it's just me being an idiot. So I'm going to be petty and say the game's stupid. There, that should give me more followers. <laughs> fuck it, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. Oh, you son of a- What the fuck just happened? Cyber Stage 27 is classic Sonic Sky Century for Sonic Generations. And this one just felt weird because as I mentioned and going to keep mentioning, the controls for Sonic Frontiers don't really match classic Sonic's type of level design, which only causes certain events to feel clunky simply because the levels were not made with this control in mind. I really was not feeling this one. During my travels I saw this particular challenge that consisted on changing this little ball of light, and at first I thought it was a night event but no, this one can be taken at any point but the night shift makes it easier. I'm beginning to think that nighttime exclusives were not planned altogether. You know what? I've already given speed a good attention. Let's see what the ring up gurgles. Six rings? What a fucking scam. I'm sticking with speed. Stage 2-6 was Skyrail from SA2. And as I keep playing this, it makes me wonder what was the issue when making the levels that are more dedicated to classic Sonic. The adventure era is undoubtedly a formula that has a, just as much focus on weight and motion as the classic stages, yet these ones feel more refined in order to fit the Frontier's control scheme. This stage was just perfectly fine to play, which actually confuses me more. It's more fitting to the control scheme, adapted the level design to fit the abilities at Sonic's disposal, and it managed to tweak the design just enough to make it feel organic. So I do wonder, why am I having a different feel with the classic 2D level design? Oh well. I found the white emerald and I could try and figure the platforming challenge or I could just mess around with the way this cliff is structured and get my way there immediately. This is what I love about the genre, I can make my own pathways while still appreciating the more intentional approaches that the game gives to the general player. Suddenly, for the first time since I started, I discovered the mechanic of the starfall. Throughout a random night, the island would start dropping was essentially star bits and you have to collect them to pull a slot machine that can give you lots of purple coins. Once again, more on that later. This is definitely a matter of preference, but given my own desire to simply explore the world and do as much of anything as I can possibly do, I will end up just not caring about whatever I was doing for the sake of collecting the star bits and have fun with the mere concept of what's happening during the night. I can understand people having issues with the visual noise, as apparently the only orange side that represents your marker can sometimes be clouded by the starlights, to the point where the radical on the top of your screen is not enough for some to get lost. But personally, I would not mind it. Does that make the individual criticism any less valid? No. Anyway, that said, I do not like that it's limited to just work during the night and when it happens again, the star bits you collected do not stock. It kinda makes the intention of collecting them pointless as you just need to get like 7 or 10 and let the slot machine do its thing. Because after that amount, it's pointless as it becomes sunrise and the slot disappears. I fought this massive creature called Strider. It's primarily a grinding minigame. You fill the circles in blue and beat him up. It can be a drag, but after shark, anything is quick pace at this point. Then I got to Cyber Stage 2-1, and as soon as I saw the rails, I recognized it as part of modern Green Hill from Generations. And I really love the sunset look on Green Hill. In fact, the lighting for the game is a step up from previous games. I also managed to prevent backtrack by finding the night challenge from the map, and in all honesty, 
That's another thing that I love about this genre of open games. Sure, there are things that can be annoying depending on how you get to experience them, but compared to a more traditional linear platformer, chances are that you won't see the specific situations in which something is a problem, since it's all a matter of how you decide to travel and the way that decision can benefit or affect your journey. Cyber Stage 2 2, I know, was based on Chunyang from Sonic Unleashed. The platforming felt a little bit better than how the Unleashed version will play out on the spinning platforms. Was I supposed to do that? I don't know and I love that I don't know. And as for the last parts of the map that I needed to unlock, it was interesting that it was the only one that wouldn't be revealed through the cleanup of the rest, which motivated me to keep a sense of attention to what's around me and to pay attention on the radical above me, rather than to just focus on the marker I set. It was a little weird, but it kept exploration interesting. But BAM! There we go, I completed the map! And to finish my travels, I discovered a platforming section that will lead me to the last of the Chaos Emeralds, but unlike previous challenges, this what felt to be going for the long run. Not only was it a very unique portion of the map unlike anything else on the island, but it provided a pretty decent platforming challenge in order to get there, with some form of liberty in how you want to travel through it. And that's the way I could actually summarize this island. Not only is it one of my favorite desert worlds in any platformer, it provides so much freedom and methods to think outside of the box, to the point where it allows you to remain interesting and big enough for you as a player to see how you want to get to a specific area. You have enough room to make your alternate pathways in this island from time to time. It is my favorite island in the game so far, and now that it's completely explored, it's time to go with our treasure hunting echidna, as well as proceed with the story. But before we do that, this section is sponsored, not really, by Pamela Ojeda an illustrator that I can recommend for their fantastic compositions and with a loyal and beautiful take on the Sonic the Hedgehog art style. Sharp black and white, individual characters, comics with panels that are easy to pick up and get sucked into the story before you even read them, and a color palette that makes every drawing feel alive and about to pop out of your screen. Just look at this Christmas theme drawing. The amount of detail put into the drawings is stellar. I swear you can look at this illustration and you're gonna spend like 5 minutes finding something new. Or these two, you don't have to even respect Ruby to say this hedgehog design is cool as shit, but the way she handles the colors, the visual effects of the petals, as well as the lighting and color palette is just beautiful. Even her take on memes are loyal to the source material given the texture of the brush. And if you're a fan of Mega Man, I cannot recommend any other artist as much as I recommend her. Her concept for the cast of Mega Man X is stellar, gorgeous, and looking at it will make you boot up your Mega Man games. Calling her work amazing is an understatement, so please, follow her on social media. You can find her under the username of DrawLoverLala, and at the time of this video, she's available on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. So please check her out and maybe consider commissioning her. She's totally worth every single penny. Let's get back to our usual programming. When it comes to the narrative portion of this island, I have to be honest, Knuckles was the weirdest one for me. I'll start with the negative part. Because of the game's natural effort of making the series have some sense of continuity, in which they try to make the previous games part of their lives, I think Knuckles' dream goal makes no sense to me. Let me elaborate by even addressing how the fuck did Knuckles even got here. The animated short that we got to promote the game shows us that Knuckles was minding his own business on Angel Island and Sky Century until he found a portal that connected his realm with Starfall Islands, but he got himself caught by Sage who was using an Ashura. Guess his climbing wasn't able to handle this shit, but as we continue to explore and help this army of Coco that Knuckles is leading to their headquarters, he begins to feel melancholic about not only being the last echidna of his tribe, but also the fact of being alone on his island making him envy Sonic's way of living and going wherever he wants to go, saying that once this is all cleared up, he wants to leave the island and live some adventures. And if you're a Sonic fan, you know this is straight up bullshit as we've seen Knuckles being a part of the crew for various different games, with the Master Everon being probably left unguarded. I don't think this is a nitpick coming for me to say, 
because it makes Knuckles' dilemma lack any tension, as we have examples of him having no problem leaving the island in order to be part of the adventure. That said, when it comes to the characterization, this version of Knuckles is probably the story's highlight for those who are fans of the guy. I'm going to put it simple, Knuckles is not an idiot. This is something that a lot of content creators have repeated in many of their own essays about the character, and I'm glad this game is making the effort of making that clear. Even the aspect of living in isolation just, just doesn't justify making him act like an ignorant, because again, this game establishes that we have been on several adventures with these characters. Knuckles is more than just a guardian of the Master Emerald by this point, and it's important for the game to recognize that. He is someone that likes to help people in order to get better, and that cares for those who cannot defend themselves. And I swear, with how him and Sonic look at each other, these two are just one compliment away from having Sonic cheating on Amy. But the moment that got me the most was seeing Knuckles have a respect for the Ancients' culture, because if any character can have a major connection with the place's history and nature, is the guy that spent the early moments of his life being a part of nature. Speaking of being part of the world, one of the things that I was worried to be a recurring theme in the game was the lack of purpose for the Titans, more specifically the way they interact with the world. You see, when Sage summons Wyvern, this stage's Titan, you have to deal with it chasing you, and as soon as that sequence finishes, you just see the creature flying through the level doing fuck all. Why make a chase sequence through the level as well as having the boss now be a part of the environment and not do anything with it. This is primarily me complaining about something that isn't real, but given how Giganto was placed away from the area you explored the first island, I cannot help but feel there was an intention to have the boss interact with your exploration. This isn't a negative to the game as it's just expectations and not real things happening in the game, but it was something I noticed. Also, as a quick thing, I'm beginning to imagine I wasn't supposed to clear the entire island because one of the plot related puzzles is to open this game of water and it's supposed to be used to give access to most of the level but I already cleared the map so... Ouch! Overall, probably my favorite of the character stories despite the questionable dilemmas As for Wyvern, easily my favorite boss in the game You have to climb this tower in order to get close enough to even approach it as it carries the last emerald, which I assume is part of the whole dynamic with these bosses. Then it makes a 180 with the chase sequence and you're now chasing Wyvern through this trail in order to both get the emerald and to beat the living shit out of it in the most visually incredible way possible. It's not just a sky fight in a separated area, you're chasing and fighting the creature throughout the entirety of the level we just spent a long time exploring. You technically cannot touch a Wyvern until you approach the front parry the attacks and stun it. So it is a harder fight than Giganto simply by the restriction of the attacks. And it wasn't until after I beat the game that I learned you can parry the missiles too, so keep that in mind, it can save you quite some time. But because of my stupidity, I ended up taking 10 minutes to beat this fight. But I could not even care because just seeing the day and night throughout the fight just made everything feel more epic as it was a fight that literally saw through the night and sunrise in order to conclude. It felt like godlike creatures giving it their all, despite one of them being controlled by a complete idiot. But I love the idea of having the entire area as the battleground for the fight, dodging missiles left and right only to get a chance to counter this monster. With breaking through it all not only being an amazing song for this game, I think this is one of the best songs for boss fights, period. Seriously, put this song on any other kind of boss fight. You will be surprised on how well it's going to fit.
and then you just make the thing if its own attacks to death. Man, anime is crazy as shit. Overall, this island was incredible. A complete step up from the first island, and it makes me excited for what's coming next. Well, it was fun while it fucking lasted. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, fuck this place. Like, fuck this place, give the place money for the Uber, and never call the place again. That's how negative I feel about it. Oh, what the f- I just got here and shit's getting weird. First of all, this stage introduces what I consider a complete troll move by making the chest icons, what will usually contain keys, gears, or mostly memory tokens, into the starting asset for a platforming challenge. Why? Why do that? The previous stages didn't need that as an indicator that you wanted to try a challenge. It makes getting them annoying and it makes me feel less excited when finding them. Especially when what used to give me around 8 or 10 tokens, now it makes me work for one. Second, I don't know if they just wanted to keep the islands have a distinct gimmick, but this one, more than any other island in the game, seems to have a fetish for forcing you to play 2D challenges. You wanna climb this tower? Gotta do it in 2D. Why? Because you've been playing too much 3D in this 3D title. Speaking of, Cyber Stage 3-1 is based off Green Forest from Sonic Adventure 2, and this stage made me appreciate the dedication of keeping the level layouts authentic to the source material. I even got curious enough to see if the platform that will give you a power-up in the original was there. And it is, but it has nothing in it, it's just a random platform in the game. But I don't know, I appreciate the need of just making it for the sake of resembling the original. This, just look at this. Why? Why is the entire exploration of this 2D? There's clearly enough space in the design to let you walk around. The implementation of 2D in the area feels incredibly forced. Oh, fuck you. Really? All that for one token? I do think the bosses are pretty cool in this island. Fortress is a chase sequence, but with grind rails, it felt very precise and accelerating to travel across the island during the fight. I think the chase fights are some of the game's best since they take advantage of the mere castle of the game. I also like what Spider had going with the skydiving, but it goes a bit too long. It's still fun though. But alright, I need to get close to- oh, What the fuck game? Okay, I guess I'll just die. Just fucking grab the key, Sonic! Okay, this is weird. I can get through this part of the challenge. How am I supposed to- Oh, oh you motherfucker! Cyber Stage 3 2. Kind of reminded me of Savannah Citadel from Sonic Unleashed. But my god, this level felt like a clusterfuck with dead ends and loops. It wasn't really a good time. <laughs> hey you, come here! Not risking having any more 2D shit. Thanks for the ride, bye! One thing I found interesting for this stage's travels is the need to separate the island into sections and bottomless pits. And like I said before, there's no issue with dying since you respawn right around the section where you died from, but I think it limits the ways to interact with the level as it is now. In order to get anywhere, you have to be in those meeting points to grind rails in order to get there. It's not the end of the world, but it feels like a tone shift with how the previous levels were designed. Nope, at this point I don't trust in the game letting me move freely, so I'm not even gonna- Oh, for fuck's sake! Cyber Stage 3 3 was modern Sky Century from Generations, and like, oh my god, it's not even subtle about just being a portion of that stage. But it's sunset, so... Woo! I hate you! God, I just wanna get a move- Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh shit, I messed up, but I think I can- OH GOD DAMN IT! Cyber Stage 3-5 is... Another stage from Savannah Citadel. More specifically, the side mission where you have to drift all over the place. And yup, it feels just as awkward as it did back then, but for different reasons. But yeah, my main advice for this stage? Do not commit to the gimmick and jump off the panel to trigger the drifting. This stage is just not good at all despite said workaround. Cyber Stage 3-4 reminded me of Apatow's side mission from Unleashed, and unlike the previous one, 
I actually prefer playing this version over the original. I think the controls are just much more fitting. Okay, guess I cannot get to the Red Emerald until I do this plot related quest. But it's okay, I guess I can focus on finishing the map first. Alright baby, you keep giving me money while I take care of this asshole. Oh, that bridge seems easy to get across. Alright, let's go. No. No, 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 that did not just happen. Maybe I made a wrong input on the, uh, and the game just glitched out of nowhere. It's something that can be criticized, but it can happen. Let's try again, but just with more confidence. Oh, you son of a goddamn piece of shit. A an invisible wall in my open game. Are you fucking with me? Right in front of my cell? No, 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 there, there's no way they thought this was an actual sensible idea. Out of all the things to do in this kind of game, th there has to be a way. Oh yeah, Cyber Stage 3 6. I don't know where it's based off, it was a bit weird with the gimmicks, but I didn't really hate it. Very meh for me, I like the song though, but uh, okay. Come on buddy, come on, but we can make it. I believe in you. We can get there and show the game we can make- Oh, you son of a mule! Okay, I'm going to make this point as clear as I can because I believe this is a flaw from the very beginning. I understand that there's a certain distinction with the game being open zone instead of being open world. I can even understand blocking certain sections of the game because of plot. In fact, I'll say this reminds me of how his lifetime rival did with Mario Odyssey, in which you can only do so much of the game without going through the story. However, Odyssey did this from the start. This is a thing a lot of games do without the player really noticing because they're not supposed to. Establishing the pattern in which the game is going to work and the liberties that you can take. Breath of the Wild shows you its true colors since the Great Plateau. Banjo-Tooie, Grand Theft Auto, Metroidvanias, 3D Mario games managed to tell each other apart thanks to that method. This game, for lack of a better term, fucking lies to you on what you're allowed to do. Up until this point, you were completely allowed, at the very least, to explore the entire island to your own accord. Or to put it on even more specific terms, the game showed promise that if you really want to do it, you can clear the map to unlock fast travel and get to the progression with relative ease. And it happened on the first two worlds, which is around the first half of the game. Without a doubt, this limitation of how you can explore the map affected my overall enjoyment of the game because now I'm skeptical of even bothering with exploration. Luckily, I think the developers thought of this and therefore decided to give players a workaround in the name of... Big. Yeah, this is the moment where I decided to warp into this purple portal that sends you to this random place where Big is just minding his own business and offers you a chance to fish in exchange of some of the purple coins we've been obtaining. And when you manage to obtain something from fishing, Big gives you some tokens that you can then trade for some kind of different item. And this is just absurd. You can get skill points, memory tokens, a bunch of cocoa, big that's human trafficking, what the fuck? Power and defense seats and even portal gears and bolt keys. But that's not all. One of the things that you can obtain while fishing are these elder and hermit scrolls, which allow you to fast travel towards the different areas in which you can find the respective elder they become another point of fast travel. And to be perfectly honest, after everything I've just gone through with this particular island, there was definitely a certain charm and calm about sitting down for a few minutes and do something completely mundane as fishing and pressing one button a couple of times, while still being a productive thing to do in the game. It helped me relax and think that I don't need to rush into the game and just enjoy myself. Having Big's fishing minigame as a way of progression for those who want to explore but don't want to deal with the cyber stages, waiting for bosses, or even grinding your silo until you get what you want, that's another thing you can do by the way, makes me think that if there's any open game for me to recommend to people who want a beginning into the genre, this could be the best starting point. I bitch about fast travel a lot, but Sonic's overall speed is enough for you to travel across the maps way easier and faster than any other game of its kind, so the traveling is not really a big issue. There's always something to do whether or not you like said things, and if you don't, 
you have more than one way to progress through the game. You don't need to do what I'm doing or completing everything in the game in order to progress. If you don't have everything at hand, the game literally tells you to go fish. With that said, just because there are workarounds with this, it doesn't remove the fact that the second half of the game, spoiler by the way, changes the approach you can have with the levels in a simple but very drastic way. If they were planning to have specific set pieces limited to the story in order to explore them, they should not have sold the illusion that I could even do that in the first place with the first half. I know I'm overblowing this critical point for me, and it's laughable given the amount of shit I've thrown to some of the criticism you see online, but here's the thing, I'm trying to bring criticism to the game within its own field and merits, rather than complaining for being something it's not. What do I mean by this? Jokes aside, I have nothing against the people I have poked fun at during this video. I don't know them as human beings, nor have I ever interacted with them on a deep level to really judge them as part of social media beyond wanting to make social posts and avoid the social part of it, like, come on. But the main thing that makes me poke fun of it is that a lot of that criticism comes more from a third party motive than based on fundamental flaws with the game itself. In a blunter way of saying it, they criticize the game because it's not another game, which is not an infallible thing to do, to put it lightly. I know preference is a thing, and I want to believe people make these comments with the obvious mentality of only speaking for themselves, rather than trying to be a voice for others to follow. But I don't think it's the best kind of criticism to say something is not like another thing, therefore it's not as good as it could be. I think that unless it's a direct sequel, criticism should be kept within the context of the product on its own. Saying that the controls in Sonic Frontiers are not good because they don't work under the same philosophy as the adventure games or the Genesis era is like saying that, yeah, I like this sandwich, but I wish it had a different kind of bread, use meat and bacon instead of just ham, and maybe even grill it a little. That's a burger! Yeah, and it's a perfectly fine sandwich, but I think it would be better if it was a burger. I grew up more with burgers, so I just want what I think is better for the sandwich, because I just wish I had a sandwich that didn't have a catch. If you recall my very first video about Sonic, you might know I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect Sonic game, included the Genesis era of Sonic games, and that's fine. I know very well that the Genesis type of games like Sonic 1, 2, 3 and Knuckles, CD and even Mania are just not for me to love as much as others do. I grew up with the adventure era and have been able to see the qualities of all the different eras and gameplay styles that the series has to offer and the very flaws on every single one of them that I have played. Although to be honest, I really love CD, I actually go back to that game a lot. So when I see arguments such as Sonic Frontiers is not that good because it doesn't have the same physics as the adventure games or Sonic Utopia, all I think is no shit, it's almost like it's not the same game. And some people think that's a valid criticism because it's not about being a good game, it's about being a Sonic game. Again, think for a second about the different style the series has taken and tell me that there's always been only one way to make a Sonic game and explain how that's coincidentally the one that suits your personal preference. I'm sure everyone will see your points with a straight face. There are so many different interpretations of Sonic the Hedgehog. Between the fluctuating canon of his many, many, many games, the four American animated series, the Japanese OVA, Sonic X, the Archie comics, the IDW comics, that when it comes to Sonic's story, you have more than enough to play. I don't know. Even in 2020, I still don't know what the hell being a Sonic game even means. Sonic's gone through so many structural changes that every new release has the possibility of starting another civil war within the community. This problem right here is tangible and is very real within the game itself. It's a shift in terms of what the game was offering up to this point and affects the way you experience playing these levels. I don't need a second game to tell you why this is a flaw. It's a flaw within itself. I'm not necessarily wanting to invalidate these criticisms. But much like how they like to say it when talking about the game, there's definitely better ways to execute the message. And as you have seen throughout my ramble on this island, and this shit with the level design, no, I don't think this game is perfect at all. I think there's a lot that can be improved about its foundation on its own. 
in trying to make it about how it should be something it's not, as much as we like that other thing, doesn't really help anything beyond personal preference and how we sometimes want things to revolve around ourselves. And this game has really proven that the standards for 3D Sonic are way higher than for any other IP. Whether if it's deserved or not, it's quite clear that society has actively agreed that Sonic should be the poster boy for every online personality out there to try and act like they know what critical thinking is, when the only feature that's critical about them has been hypocritical. You have people who will defend how it's okay that classic Sonic games punish you for going too fast since you're supposed to earn the speed, and then complain about how Sonic Unleashed is too punishing for that same reason. They'll go out of their way to poke fun of a remaster no matter if it gets fixed, and then say that the hatred is overblown when their favorite games are also technical flaws. And then there's people who will say that the popping is a complete disgrace for today's standards, and then say that even worse shit than that should not matter as long as you're having fun with the game. And if we're actually on the same page of critical thinking, it shouldn't be this selective. Either something is a legitimate problem that deserves to be called out, or it's not as long as it's fun. It cannot be both. And it's extra funny when the Sonic fanbase has been criticizing Sonic Team about not being consistent with the quality of the series, when even we cannot be consistent with our objective criticism. Oof, I think I just prevented dying from bile with this tangent alone. Where was I? Oh yeah, criticism within the game in instead of preference disguised as subjectivity. This island breaks the entire pacing of the game, and whether or not people like it, it causes mixed feelings since now you have to approach the game with a completely different perspective, which ultimately affects the experience. And I want to say it affects it negatively, because for a good chunk of the game, it gave you a different take on its levels. It creates an inconsistency within itself. Speaking of inconsistencies, it's time for our Fox Boy to have the moment on the spotlight. Since this island is primarily the point where I'm mostly going to be bitching about the game and other people's bitching about the game, because I'm a bitch, I suppose we can also spend a moment to talk about another problem that the community is, in all due respect, overblowing like it was actually an abundant problem within the entire story. Zavok would feel right at home here. Wonder how he's doing. Terrible, I hope. <laughs> Throughout some of the dialogue sequences and even cutscenes, as well as an incredibly random points of the levels, you will find the characters making mention of previous games and characters from different points of Sonic's history, not just what could be considered main video game titles. Dangle from the comics, Jet the Hawk from Sonic Riders, Sabak from Sonic Lost World, and many others. This is mostly present in this part of the story as Tails is the one that's been more involved with Sonic's life, of course. But even Sonic mentions things that Tails has done in the past, and it's executed in a way that, as some people have mentioned in other reviews, can be very direct to the point on um, being seen as a reference for the sake of having a reference. However, in full context, which is something people with serious criticism love to dismiss, not only are the most random references placed in a way that you're not gonna be able to trigger unless you look at a guide, there are also like two minutes worth of referential dialogue in a game that has at least an hour and a half worth of dialogue. The rest of the references are part of the situation that characters are discussing. In Tails' story, he struggles with the fear of being nothing more than a burden for Sonic and that he's not able to stand up for himself when it matters, making emphasis on an infamous moment in Forces where Tails is a complete coward against weaker versions of enemies he has defeated before, to which Sonic brings the reminder that he's managed to accomplish some important moments all on his own. This might be a case of how you've interacted with people in real life, but personally, this is a completely real conversation. I've been on different occasions in which I have to give reassurance to people and therefore need the direct reminder of what they have made. And I have gotten the exact mixed reaction that Tails gives them, admitting he's very inconsistent in how he acts. And unless those who say it's not a right way to approach it, can help me understand it by elaborating on what will be that better approach, then I fail to see how something that I know can happen in real life with real friends that care about each other is not a proper approach beyond personal preference. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I cannot follow a personal opinion that they make on social media for people to see if they don't elaborate about it. 
I'm sorry, but not everybody can imagine answers for you to agree on. Like, I think we're missing the point of the scene, and we should be more concerned about how the game is trying to connect even stories that will make no sense with what the games have established. Like, I would totally love to see Dark Sonic and Tails Dildo, but all that's gonna do is make me question what are the elements that they are canonizing from the comics. I know these are questions that might not be important until later games, assuming they even matter to begin with and are not just fan service. But if you'd seen some of the ideas from the comics, canonizing them into the games will make the world of Sonic way more convoluted than anything Nomura has ever done with Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy combined. I think that's a much more important conversation. But anyway, it's at this point in the story that we're pretty much certain that whatever Sonic's doing to free his friends is fucking him up, it might get him killed in the process. But he still wants to save his friends no matter what, something that makes Sage question everything she's considered up until this point, but still certain that things will end up bad for him. What is your end goal? It varies. Sometimes it's a spinning sign, sometimes it's a big old ring. I do love that line though. <laughs> that line is really funny. Okay, so we're now getting to see Tails' Coco being the technician for the army and needs our help to get things prepared for the big heroes to fight the enemy. Alright, let's see what I'm supposed to do to get to the bridge. No. No, you didn't. Oh, now crossing the bridge by jumping is a first strategy. Like, you could have just let me cross, but make the minigame relevant since we need the Coco to get across. Just making a method that was clearly not useful before, the solution, comes up as poor the science is there's no real explanation for why Sonic couldn't just explore the area. Uh, I don't know why I keep expecting better from this island. Cyber Stage 37 is straight chemical plant, like... Come on! And in the end, we get Tails to get the idea to start having more adventures by himself in order to give himself some personal growth by being in more moments where he is the only one that needs to take action. Like all characters lead to the need of having their own lives instead of having to be with Sonic, but with Tails it's something I'm more excited about. I don't want to hide too much on an idea that doesn't exist even in concept, but given this game's purpose of being a foundation for the series moving forward, the idea of characters having their own adventures makes me excited. Hell, for all we know, this can lead to a 3D remake of Tails' adventure on the Game Gear, or a Knuckles Chaotis that doesn't suck dick. Speaking of, guess what's the last puzzle of the island? Okay, but why though? I'll try to explain this and how does it suck dick. It's a score attack minigame. You have to reach a certain score in order to open a gate that gives you access to the Titan Knight. By collecting red rings, you manage to multiply the score. So what's the problem with this thing? You have lives, and if you manage to get a certain base and die because it's pinball and you cannot control the game 100%, you cannot decide how long it will take you to beat this. But now we have night, and to be honest, this fight can summarize my overall experience with this island. I cannot say that I hate it as much as I bitched about it, but it's filled with the knob gimmicks that overall feel like a different pace of what the rest of the game was giving us up to this point. But because of my experience at this point, I was able to see the good within the bad and the ways I have to overcome the bad while still calling it out as bullshit. The fight itself is metal as fuck. You had to be constantly parrying his attacks and as well as his shield to throw back at him. Surfing the shield at him was very satisfying to pull off. And while not as perfect as with Giganto, I did manage to finish it up with a proper music player. Fuck anime. Also, I think I want to make a video on Final Fantasy Sonic X. I don't know why.
After that, the next island is primarily focused on deactivating these towers located in an area within the first island that we didn't get to explore before. And this is where I can finally take a moment to talk about the rest of the plot that I've been omitted. Every Coco that we have helped has been giving us flashbacks about how they essentially died and became nothing but memories kept for the sake of preserving their history. And the mere second you look at them, you'll realize a major point of the story. These are the Ancients, descendants of Chaos from Sonic Adventure 1 and spiritual predecessors of what the Echidna tribe will set their culture on. Ages ago, with no confirmed timeline, the Ancients discovered the Chaos Emeralds and used them as power souls for them to leave their home planet before the inevitable destruction caused by... something. And yes, I am using the word discover. The game, at most, implies that the Emeralds came from space, leading to some people speculating that they created them. But not only is it something that the game doesn't necessarily confirm, like it says that the emeralds are native to their world, but we don't really see them inventing them. It kind of denies it the moment we discover that during their travel for a new planet, the emeralds were being influenced by the master emerald, which was already on Sonic's planet which also leads to the implication that there was already a direct connection, leading me to the theory that they discovered the emeralds. Otherwise, we end up with possible retcons about the connection between the emeralds and the Gaias from Sonic Unleashed, a game that they have mentioned clearly in this game, so I doubt they're just ignoring that part for their own lore. My theory is that at some point, the emeralds got sent out of space, possibly after a Gaia fight, and the ancients just so happened to have found them, but I cannot say that for sure. Anyway, once they arrive on Starfall Islands, they design the world of cyberspace as means to preserving their history, lives, and culture, but during that process, whatever destroyed their world followed them and it's planning to finish the job, to which the Ancients decided to fight back by using the Chaos Emeralds as power source for the Titans, and if everything failed, they would take the Emeralds towards where the Master Emerald was founded. Unfortunately, these preparations were not enough, as people would soon be meeting their demise despite all their efforts. Normal citizens getting to find each other at the very end before getting killed, armies sending civilians to underground shelters, and even technicians working on additional support for their titanic heroes in order to fight back. And all they met was the end. Sort of. One of the titans decided to absorb the creature so the rest of the titans could end up sealing it within cyberspace in order to prevent a total massacre, leading to the ultimate sacrifice of that ancient's end, with the rest following on getting the job done, presumably dying in the process as well. And because they knew this was a possibility, they left all of their existence and memory inside cyberspace and the Coco. Cyberspace works as a form of data recollection, not only does it keep the memories and essence of the ancients and their history, it also recollects information of those who use it later on, in order to keep learning and adapting, which is why every challenge that Sonic has to deal with when entering the portals is part of his memory of not only him, but Tails, Amy, Knuckles, and Eggman, hence why we even have stages from Sonic Adventure 2 that Sonic has no business knowing about. I don't get why is it only Green Hill Chemical Plants guys entering a random city that works as the level aesthetic. Yeah, I'm going to address that element too, as I have made clear through this video. I don't dislike the concept of cyber stages as much as people do, but having 30 levels surrounding only 4 aesthetics is visually exhausting. As far as what happened later, all we know is that as the ages went on, the survivors started mutating into more familiar forms. But as for what happened to them later to the point where Chaos was the only one left, we're not sure. But it's clear that their mission was not to repopulate or conquer the world after losing their own. They just wanted to survive, and to make sure their existence became more than just a lingering memory, and that nobody else had to face what caused their own demise. And similar to that one Asian, Sonic has been consuming a lot of cyber energy to the point of corruption and, for a few minutes, practically dead. After deactivating these towers that brought his friends and Eggman back from cyberspace, Sonic just died. He got sealed between dimensions. It's a bit disappointing that this is all this thing on his body leads to after all the advertising for it, 
but it's still unsettling to see it. But if it wasn't obvious at this point, the thing that killed the ancients is none other than the weird boys we've been following since the beginning of the game. To which Sage panics and tells Eggman that they need to get back to cyberspace, as even with the Egg Fleet, that's not going to be enough to stop it, as we had clearly seen. But Tails suggests that they can save Sonic by just getting close to him. I have no idea what did they exactly do to bring Sonic back from the corruption. Like in practical terms, it's the power of friendship. But from what I understood, what they did was to get themselves back into cyberspace in order to remove most of what Sonic's been absorbing. Which I guess they learned from how that last Titan absorbed the creature. But that did feel a bit out of nowhere, I'm not gonna lie. With that, we lead into the final thing to overcome in this game. Beat the creature in order to prevent the destruction of the planet. In order for that to happen, Eggman has to accept Sage's request to join forces with Sonic in order to save the day together. And with this, I can finally start talking about the main introduction to the series, Sage. I'm conflicted about her, but I ultimately like her as a character. The main problem, as most people have repeatedly mentioned and I'm about to embrace even more, is that she could have actually stopped the plot at any point if she just stopped her cryptid bullshit. Told Sonic that he's releasing the equivalent of the apocalypse and they can find a better solution to this predicament and save both of their loved ones. But she doesn't. She's essentially an AI created by Eggman that developed a more human form after combining both his technology with the one made by the ancients. And as such, she's been able to have control over some of the technology of the island with the titans being limited in their functions because I'm going to assume they kept part of the user's soul, as you will notice every time you kill one of them, Jesus Christ. But she quickly starts humanizing her personality, with the main core being that she wants to be seen as Eggman's daughter and protect him, to have a feeling of family and love, to be seen as not only a machine with functions and utilities for Eggman, but as someone whose mere existence is enough for him to be proud and happy about. So when she sees Sonic and Tails having that bond, it hurts her because she wants that. However, she only assumes that Sonic is a complete inept and cannot understand anything that she might have to tell him in order to prevent Doomsday. And I find that to very frustrating because it's clear they share a similar goal and that they're sabotaging each other just because Sage refuses to elaborate on anything that could be vital information. They try to justify it by saying she should not cooperate with the enemy and that Eggman refuses to form any kind of alliance with Sonic. But considering the stakes, I begin to wonder if Sage is really all that intelligent to think her father is actually correct by being this petty on a serious situation. But other than that, she is an interesting character and a point of development for Dr. Eggman. More on that later. But with that, the mission's clear. Get the Chaos Emeralds because I guess Sonic just lost him this time instead of being attacked like he would do in other islands, beat the final titan, and prevent the end. And because I'm already concerned of how much influence will the third island have on this ending, I say fuck it, big, my man, I'm gonna stay here for a bit. Oh yeah, the platforming on these towers is actually pretty good. There we go, I managed to get a pretty decent amount of plot important tools in order to finish the game with these and no need to stop my progress unless a plot related minigame demanded me to hold on. But luckily the map was technically better balanced at doing that than Chaos Island, the third one ever did. There's only one specific puzzle in which you have to materialize the bridge in order to keep clearing the map and it even manages to throw you a bone since you can technically skip a puzzle in its entirety because the fast travel leads you to the portal that was being guarded by said puzzle. It wasn't as fulfilling, but it was nice to see a compromise in rewarding the player for clearing the map in a certain way. At this point, this island is the culmination of everything we've been doing, so there's barely anything different about it. This island will be the quickest to talk about. Caterpillar was a very gimmicky boss that's fun but very time consuming especially if you're like me, who doesn't understand perception like a complete moron. But since I want subscribers, I'm going to say the game sucks instead. Cyber Stage 4-2 reminded me of Empire City from Unleash, but with a mix of speed highway, it was a very fun stage, very well designed platforming-wise, though once again, the red rings tend to be on a simple path. 
so it's a bit tricky when trying to get everything on your first try, assume, assuming that's even possible. Yup, this is the level design I'm talking about. Make things easy to figure out for the general player, but keep exploits for those curious enough. This is an objective and infallible way of thinking. And if you think I'm joking, congratulations, you have learned to use your brain. Ah! Cyber Stage 4 8. I don't know what it was based on, but my god, that was a very fast and fun level with an emphasis on verticality. I really had a fun time with that one. For 9, on the other hand, I didn't hate it. I think the level itself is well designed. The controls for the skate are solid, but the placement of the rings is what makes it all fall apart for me. Then I found this group of enemies that surround you for a simultaneous attack. And this is where I discovered you can just hold the parry, you don't have to really time the counter. Well shit, I still think there's some merit on trying to time your parry, but it is a fake out. It's up to you guys to decide whether this is a good thing or not. Stage 4-6 is a definitive point of what I mean that Sonic's movement doesn't match the design philosophy from previous games. And it's right on this specific section. I know this looks like this video was brought to you by IGN, but the controls don't know how to process the angle in which you're supposed to be moving. I swear to god, I'm trying to not make this look like the game sucks. The 2D cyber stages are clearly the ones with the hardest time being able to match the original games, and they're the biggest reason why, despite not being as negative toward the concept of cyber stages as much people online have been, they're definitely the weakest part of the game. The platforming challenges within the islands was more than enough to fulfill the platforming feel. But I just don't think they're terrible. Stage 4-3 was a clusterfuck of a stage. I have no idea where it's supposed to come from, but I still like it. The level has a lot going on in order to give you multiple forms of blasting through the stage. This was reinforced with stage 4-5. This was just blasting through the level as fast as you can. Simple and clear is the way that I want to feel because it's right and it's hard to let it go. D I don't know where that came from. Please, Square, don't strike this video. I clearly worked hard on it. Stage 4 7. Not gonna lie, this felt like a reimagined version of Tales of Mission Street uh, from Sonic Adventure 2. It's clearly not the same level since it's now designed with Sonic in mind. But if that was the case, I find interesting how they were willing to experiment with all kinds of levels from Sonic's career in order to fit in. Even though it makes me wonder why not keep doing that instead of forcing 2D, but eh. And that's it. That's all the cyber stages. I know I have barely touched on the island itself, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this section, this doesn't show anything you haven't seen in any previous island. For the better, to be honest. It's okay to have the final stage to be a mix of everything you've encountered to this point. The only real difference is that now we have more cyber stages than previously, because there's no minigames that give you emeralds, nor do you get the final one from the boss itself. Once you collect 6 chaos emeralds, Eggman gives you the final one as it's the one he found, counting on you to finish things up, and quite frankly, I think despite everything I have discussed up to this point, the ending is the biggest case of mixed feelings. But let's just finally put an end to this. Now why would I want to disappoint you? The final Titan, Supreme for instance, it's a fucking joke. It's probably easier than Giganto, the first boss. It just tosses you back and you just go back to beat the shit out of it. And for its second phase, it's the same thing, but it moves a little. One thing I found very cool and fitting for a final boss is that it cancels your pairing, but that that's it. Supreme just tanks you until it gets tired. But I want to assume it's intentional. Once you drain its health bar, the titan just stands there as the real entity finally comes out of it and plans on getting its original form into space. To which Sage decides the best solution is to leave Eggman behind and join the fight with control of the titan in order to assist Sonic in it. Now this is where it gets tricky. 
Throughout the game, you encounter around three different points of playing this shoot em up. It's a fun little minigame since to follow the rules and mechanics of a game called Ikaruga. But hey, how about we make this the real final boss of the game out of fucking nowhere? Talk about the biggest stone ship in the game. Because one thing people have agreed on is that at least the three me the main three titans are some of the best boss fights in Sonic's history. These will be final bosses in any other Sonic game. It does suck, however, that once you finish the game, all you get is arcade mode, which is a menu to play all the cyber stages without traveling between islands. You cannot replay any of the titans except the final one, since your game saves right at the end. No new game plus or anything like that. It's not the end of the world, it's not mandatory for games to have them in my opinion, but it is a bummer we cannot do that. Yet. But this, unless we're using Shadow the Hedgehog as a comparison, there's never been such a fight like this in any other game. And for people to just expect this to work organically, especially since it's only available if you play through hard mode, otherwise there's no fight at all, it's something that let people feel disappointed. But how do I feel about this? I was honestly more focused on what was happening during that fight. Because the main thing for this is that the end, just as the creature's name, gives you a very casual talk about how this thing surpasses everything you have ever encountered on throughout the acknowledgement of the types of battle the series has given to us, and with a threat that even if we end up winning, it will not matter. This thing might come back and be a constant antagonist for the series. It's hard for me to describe with just words, so I'm going to just let you play through the speech and the fight itself. But one thing I can say, there's a point where it becomes invincible in order to finish the monologue, even if there's a good chunk of the fight where it stopped monologuing to begin with. I think the monologue should have gone in one sitting and stopped the health bar if it's not done, instead of passing the damage and then keep talking, but now you cannot do anything about it. I like the idea of showing there's a possibility that this thing is not something you can actually stop, but given how it just to finish the monologue, it felt a little too forced for my taste. But yeah, this is the speech. Mortal, you have served your purpose. Now face your end. I am the all considered void. What can one boat of golden light illuminate within the abyss? Countless stars, countless worlds, countless lives. All fell to me, all brought to nothing. All the teeming chaos of creation. I saw your mind as you ran through my prison. You have fought machines and gods, then almighty. They were finite. I am infinite. I am nothing. You struggle as so many have done before. Be consumed like gold goes before me. I saw your life. Why? Arrogance, ignorance, stupidity. I was contained once. Once. Is that why? My captain has spent time and space. My captain has built a whole reality to contain me. My captain has burned their souls away to fuel their engines. And you... You glittered. 
You fly about me like a gnat. I am inevitable. I cannot be denied. You strike this incarnation with all your might. It changes nothing. You are not brave. You are not victorious. No matter what form I take, After that, Sonic and Sage managed to finally stop the end, but through an attempt on the creature to blow itself up and destroy whatever is possible, Sage decides to use her knowledge on Shadow the Hedgehog and sacrifices herself, with Sonic falling back on Earth, getting one last request. Please, look after... Father. Eggman is a character that this game really wants to make more dimensional. I don't think it makes the character unable to keep being a villain, let alone an antagonist for the series, but it definitely makes him more than just the evil bad guy that wants to take over the world. It humanizes the character through having a more complex personality. He shows respect for Sonic and his crew, resentment towards his past, reflection on what he needs to do moving forward, and most importantly, it makes you see a character that's truly interested on those he cares about. Sage's character works as a transition point for Eggman, not only as she is his creation and also the most powerful member of his empire, but also somebody that shows him what it's like to have people that love you and want you to be okay, that want you to be proud of them. Most of his characterization is found through some memo that you can obtain through Big Fishing, which is why I kept it as uh, the last bit to talk about. Chances are, you will only see these after the fact. I don't mind this as much as some people complain about, not having everything handed to them, <laughs> because it's common for games, including Sonic games, to have a lot of world building left for the player to find outside of the main story. It's just supplementary material, but it helps you care about Eggman, about why are the ancients so important to him, and it makes me realize why is Sage so important to him. Throughout the main course of the game, you get cutscenes of the two interacting and it's clear that Sage cares about Eggman. She loves him as her father, but it's only through the memos and the ending that we can get the answer of him caring about her as well. And we get a cliffhanger that shows that this isn't it for Eggman. But as the credits rolled and things started to wrap up, my final verdict for my personal experience of this game was I want to play again. I'm serious, I cannot think of a better way to describe my verdict on the game without going full generic pretentious rating like 8 out of 10 or to tell you to wait for a price drop because apparently that's different than giving a rating. In a critical sense, I hope this video has proven that the game is good, great at times, but my god can it also be fucking annoying but it still manages to make you care about the journey you're playing. There's clearly a lot going on with this game to make me say, this is not a 10 out of 10. I don't even think Morio Kishimoto, the director for the game, thinks this game is a 10 out of 10. But what I do know is that this game is clearly Sonic Team using familiar elements in a way that's never seen before, for the Hedgehog at least, in order to create a game that's both an experience but a promise as well. As I said with the title of the video, this is a big game with a bigger promise. And while that's definitely not the best selling point for people, since that will potentially mean, okay, then I'll give you my wallet next game. It's still worth recognizing that this game is not only setting things up for a future that's currently unknown, but through a game that's worth experiencing on its own. 
And if I could ask for one portion of this video to reach out Sonic Team, it's better to refine than innovate. I know there's been constant claims that this is a foundation, but just so it can be repeated from the perspective of a fan that can only speak for himself based on what he has seen, those who have enjoyed the game want more of this game. They want a better version of the Sonic Frontiers experience, not another brand new experience. And I know I sound like the cyber stages are a complete problem, but it's not that simple for me. My main message with this feedback is that whenever this game tries to be Sonic Frontiers, it's one of the best adventures that the Blue Blur has given me in almost a decade. But when it's trying to be something that came before, the experience feels less organic. The new is more than enough to make people care. And last but not least, I repeat, embrace this journey. This game has been repeatedly sold to people as the foundation for the future of the franchise. So if this is where we're going, please commit to this foundation and don't try to please ideas that might alter that foundation. Most of the focus of this game is within the story and development we're giving to the characters as well as a promising future that's gonna make the story matter. And there's people who are curious, interested, and committed to see what the future holds. These are the people that are going to matter because they want to see what your journey is going to take them. This game is not perfect by any means, but it's definitely a constantly pleasant surprise. For every element that I think would have worked out better, there's another that I'm surprised it even worked at all, let alone as good as it did. Not to mention that most of my complaints with this game come from expectations around the genre and how the game works its pacing. It also manages to be a sandbox type of game that's incredibly new user friendly, probably the most recommendable game for those who want a starting point into the sandbox genre simply by the blast processing element of the hedgehog. But in a general aspect, this game is a solid and enjoyable experience, with a lot of emotional narrative elements and a sense of continuity and maturity within said continuity that makes you care about the characters and their future, as well as the possibilities that said future holds, to the point where despite being a good game, it focuses more on offering a bigger promise. A promise of bigger things, of different ideas, characters having their own adventures and personal growth a story that still has more to tell outside of this game. It's clear that if this game becomes a success, again, speak with your wallet and for yourself. Then we have so much more to look forward, and if you're a Sonic fan, this game probably does matter. This franchise isn't the only one with a lot of characters and world building, and it's also not the only one being decades old. So I don't think it's a random occurrence that people care about this series no matter what it offers. And it's clearly something that has offered a lot of good and bad. Narrative, level design, commitment to concepts everyone seems to question, whether we like the way these things are handled on different games, or even if the games are good or not. I believe the reason you have a lot of people still talking about this series is because there's a clear passion for the ideas presented to the point where they manage to reach an emotional connection with people. I cannot help but think that's why something like Sonic Mania managed to be considered a success while something like Sonic Forces did not. Because Mania showed what it was about from the very first trailer and did not try to be anything else, while Forces tried to have something for everyone and as such doesn't even manage to connect to anybody for that matter. And this game, in a lot of areas, capitalizes on that. It works on giving you a deeper connection with these characters and the world they live in, in hopes that you're interested in what they have planned, especially if you were already a fan in the first place. Like I said, I don't think anybody will say this game is a 10 out of 10. The problems I have showed in this long ass video can prove you that. But what it offers and what it does right is incredibly memorable and promising. And whether or not they keep pushing this foundation to, in order to make the franchise keep going, it's clear that they have something for you if you end up enjoying what's presented to you in this game. Because it's clear that we're only at the beginning of this one-way dream. And 
it's one that I wanted to finish up this year. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for the support and thank you for listening. Dream.